Hello, God bless you. Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. here, and I pray that you're having a wonderful day. This is the day, as I say so often, that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I pray that you are standing on the word of the Lord. I pray that you are speaking up for the God of the Bible, and I pray that you are enjoying the blessings and the bounty of our God, for our God is good and worthy to be praised. And I thank the Lord for his goodness, his kindness, and his tender mercy. I don't think I thank him nearly as much as I ought to. I don't know if I can thank him as much as he deserved to be thanked and to be praised because he certainly good. You know, people say the Lord is good and folks shout all the time. Then they say all the time, God is good. That's a true uh, uh, statement. Those are true statements and they sound good. But you know what, man? my friends, they're not they're not comprehensive. God's not just good all the time. God was good long before he decided to create time. And there will come a day when time will be no more. And our God will still be good. Then you ask preacher, well, then what should we say? We just should simply say God is good. Because, you know, uh, in our lives, I'm sure you've been in situations where you ran out of time. The deadline came and went and the Lord still made a way. <laughs> he still stepped in and blessed you real good. Now, listen, I am excited about what the Lord is doing, but I am also, my friends, hammering away at the wickedness of the society in which we live. Uh, terrible things are going on. I have before me that I want to share with you today. Th th this picture, this picture, uh, this is a picture of a retired veteran, uh, a member of the U.S. Uh, Navy. I think he was a Navy man. Yes. And retired. And listen to this. This this tremendous man. His name was uh, Nelson Burkett. Nelson Burkett. Now, Nelson Burkett, uh, this retired officer, he was 90 years old, a 90-year-old retired officer. He served this country, and, uh, and look at how he met his end. Nelson Burkett was allegedly shot dead and run over by his own car in a parking lot on Saturday, and you know what it was? It was a carjacking. Texas officials are offering a $15,000 reward for information leading to the identification and arrest of a, sus of a suspect involved in the fatal carjacking of a 90-year-old veteran over the holiday, and the holiday was Labor Day weekend. Um, Nelson Burkett, who served in the Navy, was shot dead and run over by his own car on Saturday in Houston, according to the police. So many things have been said about the man. He was uh, said to be a man who would uh, give people rides, uh, a, a very kind man. But, but, but more importantly, he was a human being and... Uh, 90 years old, where is the respect for human life? Um, why would a young person do this? Why would you want the car that bad? What's wrong? Uh, how did your mind get so depraved that you see a 90-year-old as a good target? Well, he's old. Maybe I could. He's he's an easy lay. Maybe I can take his car from him because he's an old man. Why not look at the senior citizen and say, "Not him. Not him." Just out of respect, I wouldn't do that. That could be my grandfather. That could be my father. That that could have been my grandma or uh, great grandparents or whatever the case may be, let me show some respect. What kind of pe a person would uh, attack 
a 90 year old man and, and shoot him because you want his car. You want to take it. You don't want to work and earn and buy your own, but you want to take his and you feel justified in doing it. And not only did you take his car, you shot him and allegedly. And not only did you allegedly shoot him. Well, ain't no allegedly the man was shot. And you took his car and ran over him. This is wickedness. And I believe, oh, here I go, Brother Gary, sounding like a broken record. Here I go again. I believe, I believe that the cheapening of life in the womb is responsible for the cheapening of human life altogether. That was a time when people sell their differences. They argued, they pushed, they may get into a fist fight or something, and you fight it out, you know, uh, blow, uh, cause a little smoke, and then you go on about your way. Well, that day is over. For the least little thing now, people are killing people. People kill people, and you, you ask, well, why did you kill, uh, why did you shoot this person? Well, they disrespected me. Does your honor mean that much to you? Now you're going to really be disrespected. You'll spend the rest of your life in jail on death row or uh, in prison for the rest of your life. And you got to you got to really fight for your honor then, because when they get through with you, they're going to have you squealing like a little pig and going to mess you up all because you did not value human life. But how can we value the 90 year old, I sound like last week. How can we value the 80 year old? How can we value the lives of our senior citizens when we do not even value the life of the unborn? Life is so new that it has not experienced life outside of the womb yet. That new life inside this protective area made just for them where they get all the babies I mean all of the nutrients the oxygen everything that is needed to develop inside the mother's womb the place of ultimate safety where the child can grow and learn <laughs> And here, you, it's, it's proven that if you read to the, uh, the pregnant mother, if she reads out loud or someone reads to her, the child learns to read. The child's mind develops better. As a pastor, let me share this with you. As a pastor, as a pastor with uh, a whole bunch of sexually active young married couples, our baby section is always ablaze. <laughs> <laughs> Little babies are being born and and uh, and and mothers and fathers are doing what married folk do. Praise God in the sanctified church. They're coming together and uh, the results are just wonderful. One of the things that really moves me is when I get a chance to meet the little babies up close, the little thing that just brought them, uh, brought them back to church for the first time or for the second time. And I get a chance to just get close to them and just talk to the baby. And I'm talking baby talk. And I'm, I'm just uh, looking at the beautiful child. And, hey, you know, I'm blown away, right? It's amazing to me how that baby gives me attention, stares at me, stops moving. It's almost like the baby is hypnotized. What's, what's going on? That child has been hearing this voice since conception because mom and dad are sanctified. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. They, they, they attend church on a regular basis. And as her pregnancy grows and develops and as the baby grows over the months, for nine months thereabout, she's sitting in church and, they, and the baby hears the preacher. The baby hears the gospel. And now here's a little one month old child, a few weeks old child that when I get a chance to speak to the baby, the baby recognizes my voice. It knows the voice of mom, it knows the voice of dad, but it knows the voice of the preacher. 
And 99.9% of the times, I have never visited the, the, the pregnant mother uh, unless, you know, in, in the hospital or something, there's, there's no reason to. And uh, her husband is there, her family is there. And, uh, and so the child hears my voice only at church. And yet the child knows. That tells you right there, there's intelligence, there is life, there is, oh my, there's uh, just the splendor and the wonder that's on the child's face. Uh, uh, and it's true with all of them who are allowed to live. And yet we cut them off and we wonder why. We wonder why. Some person, some person who is evil. Yes, this is evil. To carjack a 90 year old. Well, wouldn't you don't know their circumstances. I don't care what they are. That's evil. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's, you can't, you can't rationalize evil except to say we have through our vote, through our rhetoric, through what we support, we have taught people that human life is so cheap that you can take it for a car or take it for a fun drive or take it because, I don't know, you just want to. And then run over the man. They took his life for a car. Uh, perhaps every 90 seconds or so, uh, a child in our country is aborted. For those of you who are watching this and you, you, you've had an abortion and you've repented of your sins, please do not feel bad as I talk about this. You're forgiven. Walk in God's forgiveness. And you don't have to repent every time this subject is broached. You don't, don't, don't feel like you need to go back to the altar. No, 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 no. You accept the Lord's forgiveness and you go on. Go and sin no more. And if you get a chance to help someone else, take it. It's amazing to me how people have redefined what a hypocrite is. Oh, you're a hypocrite. If you have had an abortion and now you're trying to talk me out of having one, you're a hypocrite. That's not hypocrisy. They've just learned and they're trying to keep you from making the same mistake that they made. And I also want to say this for those who are watching and you've, uh, you've had an abortion or you've participated in, in one and you've confessed your sins to the Lord Jesus. D don't feel the need unless you just desire to, to tell everyone else about that. It's no one's business. If the Lord, nobody stands up and confesses all their sin. No one does. It doesn't make any sense. You know, we talk about transparency. The Bible talks about discretion. You got to know what to tell, when to tell, and what not to tell. So my, 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 well, I'm not after anybody for any past transgressions or any past sins. I'm trying to save the next child. I'm trying to affect the thinking of that mother who is on her way to the clinic and perhaps she will somehow come across this. I'm trying to say to that person who may be considering that option, don't be like the man who killed this 90 year old man for a car. You know, you, 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 you're considering having the abortion because you're in college, you're in school, and uh, it may cost you a semester or two. You may have to drop out. The guy who killed this man wanted a car. It's the same thing. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Let the baby live and the Lord will bless you. And, and, and every preacher, everybody in society needs to talk this way because I believe, I firmly believe, Brother Gabriel, I've said it to you a thousand times, that I believe the cheapening of human life in the womb has made life, human life, cheap for everyone. Whether you're an unborn baby, a newborn baby, a teenager, 
an athlete, a football player, in broad daylight, someone trying to rob you and they shoot you in the chest, whatever. All these things are going on because we have cheapened human life. Our Lord said this. He said, um, and he was on the cross. And um, uh, the cross, uh, they took the cross actually from Jesus and gave it to Simon of Cyrene. And there followed him great a great company of people and of women which bewailed and lamented him. And while they were, Simon of Serene was actually carrying the cross. While they were crying about Jesus and, and his fate and what was being done to him and the way they'd beaten him. And by now our Lord is swollen and blooded and beaten and spit upon. And uh, all of these things have happened to him. Oh, it was a gruesome sight. His back is laid open. Uh, the muscles and I, 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 dare, I dare to say that he could walk properly because that, that cat, that, that cat, that, that whip would uh, reach into his flesh when they would whip him and when they beat him and just pull out with the bones and the metal hooks and things, pull out flesh from our Lord. He did it for you. He did it for me. He took our place. So now he's grotesque looking. He's bleeding. He's walking up Golfers Hill. And there were women there. And there was a crowd, and they were crying and they were lamenting. And he looks at the women, and he addresses them directly. He says, "Daughters." Of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and, and the wombs that never bear and the paps that never give suck. Blessed are women who will never experience nursing their babies. Wombs that never get pregnant. Times will be so bad that uh, pregnancy would not be viewed as a viable option. He said, they, then shall they begin to say to mountains, fall on us and to hills, cover us. Then Jesus says this, and this is what I want to leave you with and invite you to our service tonight with. For if they do these things in the green tree, what will they do in the dry? <sighs> Let me explain this proverb, what he's saying. If you have done this to a man, to me, and I'm here for you, I came to bring you salvation. And if you would do this to me in the time of peace, and I'm innocent, what will you do? How severe will the judgment be for those in the time of war and in the time of judgment? If you do these things when the times are good, what will you do when times are bad? America, we are $34 trillion in debt. Sooner or later, we got to deal with it. You know, everybody, these politicians talk about, talk about our strong economy. It may be strong, but it's fragile. The debt load is too high. For every one person today who is getting a Social Security benefit, there's only 3.3 .3 persons paying into the system. In the 1940s, for, for every person who received a benefit, there was at least 140 people, 150 people thereabout, approximately, paying into the Social Security. What happened to the people? We killed them. We got smart. We started having abortions. Yes, in the 1950s, black replacement level of births in our wonderful community 
was 3.2, 3.5, something like that. It takes 2.5 to over a 25 year period of births to sustain a race. Today, we're 1.7, 1.5, something in those numbers. We're not even giving birth at replacement levels. If you don't see the coming dry, your eyes are closed. If you don't see that we're headed somewhere, your eyes are closed. And we're headed to a horrible place without Jesus. Hallelujah. We need Christ. I don't know if this nation has reached its tipping point yet. I don't know if we've gone too far. But I do know this. If we're not at a tipping point, we're tittering on one. And if that happens, oh God, may God have mercy on the souls of those who are here during that time. Now, those of us who believe God, Jesus is coming back to get us. The rapture of the church is going to take place. Hallelujah. And I'm grateful and I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do for the believer. But every believer should do everything that he and her can do to reach the loss, to reach lost souls. Yes, people are going to be lost, but they ought to be lost despite our best efforts to help them get found, to help them see Jesus, because Jesus is the deliverer, Jesus is the savior, and listen to me, my friends, Jesus is our only hope. Now tonight, we're going to have wonderful service at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ, I will not be here tonight. Uh, I will be making my way, hopefully, home from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, as I was out having to be there uh, for a forum uh, for the General Assembly of the Church of God in Christ for those who are running for the General Board. Now, I need your prayers, and I need your patience, and that you would bear with me during this time we're in the stretch of the campaign. And uh, when I consider why I'm doing this, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be doing this. If I didn't believe God would have me to do it, and if I didn't believe that I would be able to contribute to our great church. If I'm allowed to serve, and Jesus, God only knows what will be, and if it's the Lord's will, it would take place. If it's not the Lord's will, then it won't. I need Jesus, and I need you. I'm asking you to vote for me uh, in November when we have the election. But my why, my why, because my heart is in preaching and teaching the word of God. My heart is in being at in place at the upper room on Thursday nights. I don't like missing. I don't like uh, breaking my pattern. I, I pastor the greatest church in the world. I, that's my opinion. I have the most wonderful audience, even though I get on them sometimes for not saying amen. <laughs> I love you. And you guys show me so much love and so much support. Coming up on my pastoral anniversary, my 37th, I don't know of people who are more kind and more loving and more generous to their pastors than the people that God has given me to pastor. And I want you to know every Thursday night that I'm not in place or if, or if something happens where uh, for some reason I can't be there on Sundays, um, you don't miss me as much as I miss you. And our audience, our streaming audience, trust me, uh, you don't miss Brother Wooden like Brother Wooden misses you. We tried to put up some a preacher and a teacher, and I thank God for a deep bench who would deliver a wonderful word. But I tell you, it breaks my heart when I'm not in place. But we will be in place uh, soon and very soon. And tonight, it's going to be a great service 
at the upper room, Church of God in Christ. But I pray that you will continue to bear with me and pray for me and stand with me uh, as we uh, campaign and go where we need to go to speak to people. But my why? I want to talk to you about this as we go off, Gary. I've gone long, gone long, I've gone long. But my why, my why, thank God for Brother Gary Leach. He's my producer for these uh, uh, Thursday night uh, promos. I used to call them little promos. And Gary told me, he said, don't ever say little. And he was right. But my why is that I desire, now listen to me, listen to me. I desire a seat at the table on the board of directors of the Church of God in Christ, also known as the General Board. I want to seat at the table to, to argue for, to speak up for, to be a voice for the things of God and the God of the Bible. I believe that the Church of God in Christ is the greatest church in the world. I believe that God has strategically put us, placed us where we are today for his glory. I don't believe that it's the will of God for us to uh, be a church that is a rubber stamp for whatever the devil is trying to do. I believe that God has raised us up to, cr to cry out for biblical morals, biblical truth, biblical families, the biblical definition of marriage, the biblical definition of what a male is, what a female is, the biblical, uh, we, we to, to adopt the biblical worldview on life. I believe that God has called us to recognize the biblical teaching of boundaries. Yes, the biblical teachings of preaching and teaching the word, the standing on the word of God, I believe it. And I want to lend my voice to others who are on our general board. And if I'm allowed to be a part of the board, then I will, I will do these things. Now listen, the presiding bishop speaks for the general board. The presiding bishop is the voice for our national church. And that will not change. Neither should it. God has blessed our church and it's a great church. But I desire a seat at the table to speak up for the things of God. And if I'm blessed to do that, I promise you this, I won't change. I'll be the same wooden that you know today. And for those of you who are waiting for me to morph into uh, someone else, I'm here to tell you, I can't do it. It's not going to happen. Even if it costs me, I can go down in defeat being who I am. I can, I can live with that versus beginning to pretend uh, to win. Uh, we, we're seeing a day now where politicians literally, literally, change their accents. Gary, they change their accents depending upon where they are, depending upon the crowd. Well, my friends, I talk like I talk. <laughs> I am who I am. And the my core positions, I do not change on them. I believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I believe that the Bible is the only written, infallible, in Errant word of God. Hallelujah. I believe the Bible is right as it is. I believe that Christianity does Christianity doesn't need tweaking. It doesn't need to be reimagined. It doesn't need to be rethought. We just need to live it. No more, no less. Just live it. Praise God. I believe that our church. The church of God in Christ is a Pentecostal holiness church.
Pentecostal. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the activity of the Holy Spirit. We believe in speaking in tongues. But also, we believe in, now check this out, the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. See, many of us have mastered a tongue, but uh, what about the fruit of the Spirit? What about that? What about love, joy? Uh, all the wonderful things that, that make up the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. I believe these things need to be manifested in the lives of all believers. And good judgment, praise the Lord. And I do not believe as I go off, you can tell I'm a preacher this is my second or third signing off. I don't believe in praying in one direction, then voting in another. I believe in being integritous at one. The prayers and the votes should go in the same direction. And if you believe like I do, vote for me. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and if you don't, then don't. <laughs> and we're going to all be fine, still be good friends. I'm going on with Jesus just the same. So I want to invite you tonight to watch, to be a part of the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. You are going to get the word. And my friends, we'll be together again real soon. God bless you. Thank you for your time. And uh, I, I thank you for indulging me today in this rather lengthy uh, promotion. God bless.